heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 273, covering the week of August 2nd through August 6, 2021. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, like our Gab page, that's G-A-B dot com, and follow us on YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube page. YouTube page is great. You've got this podcast there. You've also got all of our lectures, our Abbeville U material. It is a great resource, and it's all free of charge. I mean, that's the coolest thing about it. And so after we do our summer schools, our conferences, we always put our lectures up there eventually. We've got all our Abbeville U stuff, which are these short five-minute videos dedicated to exploring different parts of the Southern tradition. We're going to do more of those. We haven't, we haven't stopped that. But of course, all of this requires funding. The website, our programs, our webinars, everything that we do. So if you like what we do, consider a tax-deductible donation to the Abbeville Institute. It is tax-deductible to the full extent of the law, and you help us explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. Also, while you're at our website, abbevilleinstitute.org, give us an email address. We'll give you a free ebook exploring the Southern tradition. It's a great book written by 20 Abbeville Institute scholars. Also, click on that shop tab. You can get your Abbeville Institute apparel, our logo, and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, golf shirts, t-shirts, hats. Great way to advertise the Institute. As always, share this podcast around on social media. Rate it where you get your podcasts. Let people know you're listening to the Abbeville Institute. Let people know you're interested in the Southern tradition and what that means. And that is the general theme of this particular week. We've got... Some really good stuff this week, and we're going back in the archives here a little bit. We had a couple of pieces that were contemporary, meaning that they were just published this week. But we've gone into the archives, and we dragged out a couple of articles, one from 1958 and one from 1936, in fact. Uh, The 1958 piece is by Robert Drake, who died in 2001. And the 1936 piece is from Frank Owlsley, who died in the 1950s. So uh, he was one of the agrarians. And so we've got a couple of these from the archive, from the vault pieces. Now, they, of course, they weren't published at Abbey Institute. We didn't exist all the way back then. One was published in Modern Age and the other in the American Review. Um, but they are really good pieces, and I want to focus on them a little bit this week. And I want to focus on them because of the first piece of the week by Boyd Cathy, The End of America. And when you look at what he's saying in this piece, he says, my response to that line of thinking, which is if we just win back Congress in 2022, all things will be right again, is that Republicans had control of Congress and they they had the presidency. They had Donald Trump and the Republicans controlled Congress. And what happened? Well, it's not about politics any longer in this way. The structural things that are happening underneath the surface are creating the the politics of discontent, as Lewis Powell, the Supreme Court Justice, pointed out in 1971. The politics of discontent. So you've got all these articles, he points out, from 2021, June, July of 2021. Um which is the culture war. And he says, add to these stories and accounts, uh, and these stories and accounts can be multiplied by the hundreds, by the thousands at every level of society. Tune in to Tucker Carlson tonight, and you'll see what I mean. There are examples of a pervasive sickness which afflicts large portions of our culture. They are emblematic of profound problems and radically irreconcilable divisions among our population. We all may live in the same geographical entity, but we don't speak the same language. We don't share the same beliefs. We don't think the same way. One half of us wish to cancel, even suppress the other half of us, and to achieve that by any means possible, including violence. Is that any different from the first few months in Eastern Europe, European countries right after World War II as communists infiltrated and seized absolute control and authority? And all the while, the official voices of opposition to this madness, the official conservative opposition, and most national Republicans seem like deer caught in the headlights. In the past, when a Southern writer would suggest that some form of secession or separation was desirable, he would be met with ridicule. The South will rise again? You've got to be kidding. Now, 160 years after the war between the states began, that such talk of separation is no longer considered the domain of nostalgics or of the unreconstructed. 
unreconstructed, excuse me. In recent years, we have seen the Cal Exit movement advocating that left-leaning California leave the American Union and assert its independence. A number of conservative counties in eastern Oregon and northern California have offered officially petitioned to leave those radicalized states and either join Ohio, uh, Idaho or perhaps form a new state. Academically, Professor Frank H. Buckley has written a cautionary study on what he calls the looming threat of secession. There are others. Richard Kreitner's Break It Up, which is from the left. right? I mean, there are other people talking about this. I think Boyd Caffley is, is right on here. There are people talking about decentralization. Why? They're talking about decentralization in some form because nationalization of everything has created this great big monstrosity that's a real problem. It's actually, the, the point of it all is to abuse various subsections of the American society. And think about that. What Kathy is pointing out, Dr. Kathy is pointing out here, is that the South in particular is be, has been demonized for so long and Americans are being told they're bad for so long, and that's done on purpose for power. Right? This is Hillary Clinton saying that people are deplorables. Could you say that to any other group in American society besides essentially white, Christian, middle-class Americans and get away with it? Could you call any other racial group, religious group, any other group of people in any other section of a society, could you call them anything else and get away with it? No. But you see, the point of all of it is power. If you demoralize people to an extent, and this is something we, we receive from young people, they are so demoralized because they've been called so many names for so long that they don't know what to do anymore. And when they finally wake up from this slumber of being demoralized and defeated and downtrodden and, and dismissed, called all kinds of names, deplorables, rednecks, hayseeds, stupid, racist, whatever it is. They are called all these things. When they finally wake up from all of that and realize, oh my gosh, there's something beautiful about being from the South. This is what the Abbeville Institute is all about. That's why we ran the piece that we did on Tuesday, which I'll get to in a minute. But Kathy points out that there really is a growing discontent because people are tired of being called names and all kinds of things. They just want out of it. And the left, the leftist Cal Exit people, well, they, they want the same thing. They don't want, I mean, look, they've realized that perhaps this is a union that can't be maintained if we try to maintain a national entity. Now, when you go back and you look at the founding period and you look at, say, for Virginia, where Edmund Randolph stand there and, and implored and just beg them, please maintain the union. I'd rather be in the union with defects and out of it because it's going to cause all kinds of problems to be out of it. We're going to be invaded and destroyed. And you can understand that in 1788. You had this vast wilderness. You had the British on the frontier and the Spanish on the frontier. You've got problems there, potentially. You've got this big ocean. You don't have a navy. You don't have an army. You really don't have any money. So what are you going to do by yourself? And this is what Randolph essentially said. We can't go it alone right now. Is that the case, though, in modern America? Do any of these states, would California be so bankrupt and without resources that it couldn't protect itself and couldn't go it alone? Now, the other, of course, the other model, the other concern, I should say, was civil war. If California broke off, would other states fight California? If you had multiple confederacies or multiple independent states in North America, would these states fight it out? Well, not if you had a real Jeffersonian vision of America. You wouldn't if you had respect for differences and saying, look, I have my differences with you, and so these are things that we need to say, let's just live and let live. And I'll, there was a an interview I was watching with William Buckley and George Wallace. And George Wallace said, you know, I really don't care what happens with the education in New York. And, and Buckley said, well, why not? Why not? Uh, the, the, these, are, these, are, uh, these are in your country. And, and, and Wallace said, well, of course, you know, I mean, I care if, if they're well-educated. But you know what? My focus in Alabama is Alabama. I care about what's, that's where I live. Right now, Wallace at that point was trying to run for president of the United States. So Buckley, oh, you're not qualified. 
Uh, how do you think? Uh, did, did, did you uh, need to uh, did, uh, go out and uh, what do you think about this? And uh, did, did New York. And of course, it was funny because Wallace kept just pegging Buckley on some things. And Buckley was getting so frustrated. It was hilarious to watch the interview. But um, the, the fact is you had, uh, you have this, that's a very Jeffersonian answer that Wallace gave. You know, I'm worried about what happens in my state. You worry about what happens in your state, and he kept calling Buckley a New Yorker. You worry about what happens in New York. I'll worry about Alabama. It's not really your business what goes on in Alabama. And Buckley's, well, yes, it is. It's my business. It's my country, right? I'm worried about what happens in every school across America. That's a very Lincolnian vision. Wallace was a very Jeffersonian vision, and I think that's what we're getting to now, the resurrection of Jeffersonianism and what that means for, for American political life. But part of that has to become a realization for a positive view of the South and of Southern society. That has to be part of it. Southerners have to be proud to be Southerners. And not just, uh, I mean, you know, we get into some of this stuff and you see people, I'm proud to be Southern. And it's very plastic. It has no meaning. Uh, and unfortunately, it's um, it often is than uh, made fun of by other people. But Southerners for a long time thought that they were superior to other people. I mean, Southerners looked down their nose at other parts of American society. They were superior. Southern superiority was something. And uh, that's something that I think we need to recognize. And in fact, the piece on Tuesday, What It Means to Be a Southerner by Robert Drake, again, published in 1958 and Modern Age, at the beginning of the piece, we said this, in an effort to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, we offer an explanation of what it meant to be a Southerner in 1958. This raises the question of what has and has not changed in the South, and if themes in this essay can still be applied to the 21st century Southerner. And so Robert Drake wrote this when he was 28 years old. He died in 2001 at the age of 71. He wrote this when he was 28 years old, for modern age, an exploration, he taught literature for years, and an exploration of what the South is and isn't. And it's a beautiful essay. It's a beautiful essay because he brings up some things that Southerners are and are not. He says, but Southerners are tolerant, I maintain. Southerners are tolerant. And I think I know why, he says. It is because they are not so foolish as to believe that there are no differences between people. In spite of what the August gentleman on the Supreme Court may say, the Southerner knows that people are different, that they are created by God Almighty different, so that they might reflect back to him his inscrutable glory and all its rich perfection. He says, this, of course, does not mean that all men are not equal. All this stir about equality is really due to a perversion of the idea of unity and diversity. For I suspect that what the Southern is most vitally concerned about is not the pre preservation of unequal status. But he talks about racial differences here. And, of course, 1958, camp, this is something we wouldn't agree to here. But he brings up at the end of this, um, he says that the Southerner knows that under, uh, he says that, but as I've said, Southerners are tolerant and above all charitable. For the most part, they have dealt fairly with their less fortunate brethren, both black and white, because they can never regard people as less than individuals, less than total personalities. The Southern does not believe that you can abstract from the individual his identity and treat him as a ward of the state, a client on relief, or as the object of a social program without comprising compromising his integrity. He knows that relief comes from the head, but charity comes from the heart. This is why the welfare programs have been more backward in the South than they are in the more progressive parts of the country. Indeed, I am inclined to think that this reluctance of the Southern to employ public support for private charity is a more important factor in this so-called cultural lag than the more obvious lack of funds. This charity, as I've intimated, is a result of Southerners' refusal to see people in the mass on a, stat a statistical chart in the abstract, or in any other guise and what they are, immortal souls, all equally precious in the sight of God. 
And he gets into some political things. Again, this is 1958. So he's going to talk about race in this essay, which that's not what we're exploring is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. But he says some things about Southerners. This is why the questions were asked. What can we find in this that you could still apply to some of the Southerners today? Well, Southerners still are the most charitable people in the United States. Southerners still are tolerant. And this is, again, something Wallace brought up with, with uh, Buckley. He said, look, uh, we're tolerant in the South. Um, you know, we, we have a more diverse society than anywhere else. People get along in the South just fine. And this is something that people have pointed out. Individuals got along with each other just fine all throughout Southern history. It's when you start getting to group dynamics and you start getting uh, discontent and incitement, that's when things get really nasty. And you start categorizing people as groups. There's black Southerners, there's white Southerners. And, and Southerners were just as guilty of this as anybody else at times. Of course. But that's the real problem. When you stop, stop treating people as individuals in God's image and as valuable people, that's when you start running into problems. When you demonize people simply because who they are, that's a problem. He says, this fact accounts, um, where he says, the South is surely one of the last strongholds of the life of tradition, of doing things as they've, as they've been done for a long time, not from any idolatrous sense of duty, but because subordination to tradition is a means of defining one's direction in life and of giving one's whole life greater dimension and depth. He says, this fact amounts in my mind, to my mind for the glorious renaissance now being enjoyed by Southern literature. And he brings this up. In the 1950s and before that, when you had the 30s into the 50s, a Southern literary renaissance. He says, but the South's religion has been part of its living tradition. It has even formed a part of its mythic consciousness, as we know from the stories of Rourke Bradford. The same folk spirit that has sung about Davy Crockett and Casey Jones has shown an equal gift for shaping its whole vital consciousness around the fearful but marvelous humanity of the patriarchs and apostles, and finally around the, the scandal, mystery, and the glory of the Incarnation itself. The South's Christianity, by definition overwhelmingly Protestant, has commanded individually and tolerance, individuality and sorry, intolerance, sometimes to the point of complete anarchy in religious affairs. And yet this is always the price of freedom, one of its risks which must be accepted with responsibility and goodwill. As one would expect, the South has remained fiercely opposed to external authority and religion, and as in other matters, still upholding the right of individual choice and determination. He says, in closing, I, I say that I have not presumed to treat the subject of Southern characteristics exhaustively here. I could mention many more of the Southerners' peculiar traits, his love of land as a living symbol of God's province, almost a sacrament. His hospitality, his native friendliness and warmth, his generosity to those less fortunate. On the other hand, there are some things that are not altogether to his credit. Many of these virtues, which are in themselves so praiseworthy, can be subverted from their proper ends. And certainly the Southerner's quite proper pride in his individuality and his region can become pernicious if allowed to run rampant over the interests and affections of others. Indeed, William Alexander Percy, the lawyer poet of the Delta, said that one possible cause of strained relations between North and South in the decade before the Civil War was the fact that Southerners stopped thinking they were simply as good as anybody else and began thinking they were better than anyone else. And as Eudora Welty has shown, the characteristic Southern life of the warm and loving family circle, the life which Stark Young, the drama critic and novelist from Mississippi, has called the life of the affections, can become a living hell when this love is diverted from its ultimate end and is used and exploited for purely selfish purposes. He says, but the best of the Southern writers point that the way to what is best in Southern life and Southern society. I should like to think that they constitute for the Southerner a great cloud of witnesses en encompassing him with the forceful imperative of their example and pointing toward the surprisingly rich inheritance, the psalmist's godly heritage, goodly heritage, which is the Southerner's portion, a life of the affections, a wholesome fear of God's judgment, and an earnest, earnest longing for the redemptive grace of his saving word, and finally, with all his saints, the hope and of glory. So, a great essay. Again, what can we pull out of the Southern tradition? He talks about all these traits of Southerners that are great. 
And this is part of the reason why we focused on music in Tom Daniels' piece, What Makes This Musician Great, great by Hank Williams, or on Hank Williams, I should say, by Tom Daniel. Hank was a product of what, of his place, Alabama. And that's something that Tom likes to bring out in these pieces. They're a product of their environment. And part of what makes them great is the fact that where they're from was great. And the culture was great. It wasn't perfect. No one would ever say it was. I mean, you had all kinds of bad things going on in poor Alabama society, without question. And in the vices of Tennessee and Nashville and everything else. But the thing that made Hank Williams great is his attachment, in my mind, to people and place. So that is certainly the real pull of Southern music. It's authentic. And the South was authentic. And so when you get to this Owsley piece, the Old South and the New, from 1936, he begins the piece by saying, Years ago during World War I, I traveled from, during the World War, I should say, World War I, I traveled from Chicago by way of Cincinnati to Montgomery, Alabama, in the company of a group of young ladies from the North who were visiting their menfolk and camped at Camp Sheridan. None of them had been South before, and they were looking forward to the journey through the sunny South with considerable excitement. They had, despite everything which had ever been said to the contrary in the North, a romantic conception of the South. They expected to enter a pleasant land of white column mansions, green pastures, expansive cotton and tobacco fields where Negroes sang spirituals all the day through. But with the exception of the bluegrass ba basins of Middle Kentucky and Middle Tennessee, and an occasional fertile valley here and there where beautiful old homes sat, yet stood amidst their fertile acres, no such picture greeted these romantic young ladies. After crossing the Ohio River, what they saw, with the exceptions of these lovely spots of Middle Kentucky and Tennessee, were gutted hillsides, scrub oak and pine, bramble and blackberry thickets, bottom lands once fertile, now senile and exhausted, with spindling tobacco, corn, and cotton stalks to bear witness to the, the senility, unpainted houses which were hardly more than shacks or here and there, the crumbling ruins of old mansions covered with briars, the homes of snakes and lizards. On for hundreds of miles, this desolation unfolded. The sunny south of romance had disappointed my friends. There were always lovely spots here and there, but the rush of the train soon carried us past such oasis back to the wastes. Such is a picture also of the south from Washington to Miami, Florida, if one travels through the southern states east of the mountains, with the exception of the beautiful Shenandoah Valley and the fertile region of middle Georgia. Such is a picture of the country, with the exception of the fertile Black Basin of middle Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, and the delta along the Great River and some of its tributaries, if one travels west of the Mississippi. There are beautiful cities in the south, lovely towns and villages, but the panoramic view of this land is one of ruin and desolation. There's one important element, however, in this southern scene which gives me some cheer, the people. If one does not travel too fast through this desolate country, he will find some acquaintance with his inhabitants, and if he has lived elsewhere, he will be struck by the courtesy and good manners and the genuine kindliness of even the most humble people, as well as their high level of integrity. He will be impressed by other characteristics, too. From high to low, there is a keen sense of humor and love of fun. Life is not as barren as it looks. The religious sense is highly developed in the South, which Mencken has been pleased to call the Bible Belt, and the people on the, as a whole still cling to the belief that their fathers from which they derive solace in their bereavements and comfort in bearing the dep deprivations of poverty. In sharp contrast to this religious sense, one who sojourns among these people long enough will find other characteristic, the decided tendency toward homicide as a, more, as a mode of settling permanently certain types of personal differences. So that violent part of it, which of course people have talked about how violent the South is. And Hackett Fisher pointed out in his book on the four British folkways in North America, certainly that is an issue. The violent South, the homicide rate is high in the South. But he brings up the people. The people are what makes the South. The place, of course, is there a geographical determinism here? Well, Southerners postulated that if Yankees had been able to, to keep plantation agriculture, they would have kept slavery as long as they could have. That it's only because of the agriculture, because of the climate and geography, that the South hung on to that institution. Hackett Fisher actually says that essentially Southern culture made that, not the other way around. 
And this is a book review, essentially, from a book that uh, was published, in, again, around 1936. And it gets into detail what the Old South was and what the New South is. And, of course, Owlsley, interested in the New South at the end of this, is very critical of this New South movement, of the factories. He said the factories that popped up in the New South were a detriment to the South, not a benefit. Because what was happening here is that all these charlatans, who he's in agreement with almost on, on uh, Mencken, that the lowest level of society was able to build these factories through coercing people into, or like, cajoling them, more importantly, into putting their money into it so they could get out of the fields. Now, on the other hand, Southerners, a lot of Southerners, loved working in factories compared to the fields because it gave them a, a steady paycheck. It made it to where they didn't have to worry about the ups and downs of rain and heat and drought and all these things that cause it was too wet or too dry. And you, the, the bull weevil and uh, you know the problems of agriculture. They didn't have to worry about that anymore. They could just go work in a cotton mill and you got paid. You just go work and you come home. And that regularity of it was something that appealed to them. Of course, Owsley thinks that the land not being used should be bought by the government, distributed out, redistribution. This was popular in the 1930s. The distributionism of people like Owsley and the agrarians and people like uh, Heli, uh, Belloc, Heli or Belloc, Belloc and G.K. Chesterton and others, they were looking at that kind of economic system as something to create this viable agrarian economy. The love of land. Certainly, that's still part of the South. And even when Owlsley talks about how bad it was, people still loved it. They still wrote about it. Of course, most of the songs about the sunny South, you can understand why these women thought the South is great because that's all they'd heard in World War I. Uh, the music, the plays, everything was about how great, this, how beautiful and warm and relaxed the South was. And people still loved it. And the music reflected that. Hank Williams reflected that love of people and place in his songs. Of course, Heartache and other things, but certainly reflected that love of people in place. And what he was is built on where he was from Alabama. And, of course, when you look at the proprietors of the, the uh, Callaway family, for example, in Georgia, and it's a nice example of, or the Dukes, which he brings up in this essay, the Reynolds and others, all these Southern industrialists, not all of them were bad people. Not all of them were charlatans. The Callaways were certainly interested in, in trying to make life better for Southerners. And they thought the only way they could do it was, co was cotton mills. I mean, agriculture had been so worn out. Owsley doesn't really mention that as much. But the price of cotton had gotten so depressed because everybody was told to go plant cotton. And so once you do that, well, that creates an environment where the cotton price is going to go down. But certainly this love of place was something that all Southerners had in common. And again, when you wake from this slumber and you realize that there's something beautiful about this place and the people in all of this, it's not bad. I mean, you're told your whole life, all these people are bad. All these things are bad in the South. You're just bad. You're descended from bad people. And when you wake up from that and you realize that's not true, then what does that do? What do you have left? What do you, you start to have this thirst for the real history of your people? And that's where the Abbeville Institute fits in. And I want to wrap up the, the week with a little poem we had a, by Demetrius Garland Bowman, um, who's an independent poet in North Carolina. He sent this to us a little while back, and we just didn't publish it till now, but it's an ode to the Waccamaw, which is, a, of course, a river there on the border of North Carolina and South Carolina. The poem is, My heart bled al along the Waccamaw, where ancient warriors reigned. I wonder if their spirit saw as I kneeled there, pained. Carolina, she beckoned me to rise, and her warm sun kissed my face. A glory came for my eyes, which is this southern place. Hail you, Carolinas of mine, you've dearly blessed your son. There's naught I'd rather be than thine. I am grateful for all you've done. Your beauties are like Eden to me, and I shall never forget you, are more. You will be the first and last I see, and there's nothing I'd want more. A Tar Heel I was in the womb, and that I have been all my days. A Tar Heel I shall be in my tomb, having sung this final praise. That spirit of place 
and loving a place and a people is what really makes the South unique in America. And I think that's what Drake is getting to take out the racial stuff, which he gets into 19, 1958. That was going to be on the, on the thoughts of everybody in 58. But take that away. But even there, he's, he's uh, fairly moderate in what he's saying for 1958. Uh, and then, of course, you know, same thing with with uh, Owlsley writing in 1936 about the people. And then, of course, the end of America with Boyd Cathy saying that the people matter. We have differences of opinion. Let's celebrate these differences and celebrate the Jeffersonian vision of America, which could be decentralization in many different ways. It could just be the reassortment of the states. It could be the reassortment of local communities, all kinds of things. It doesn't have to necessarily be secession at all. It can be something else. It could be real federalism. These are the things that can change America. And why the Abbey Valencia Institute exists, because we want to explore these beautiful parts of the Southern tradition. Literature, music, the people, the place, the food, the environment, whatever it is, the political tradition, that's what makes the South great. Until next time. Yeah.